And so I will, be I will be reviewing basically several projects that are done in collaboration. And here at least my collaborators, Vadim, Vadim Baru, Arseniy Filin, Jambo Gigelia from Bochum, Alexey Nefediev from Moscow, Christoph Hanard from Ulich, Ulf Meissner from Bonn and Ulich, and Kian Wang. So I should uh, also emphasize that uh, basically the main driving forces behind this project are Vadim, Arseni, and Alexei. Okay, so this uh, workshop is actually about mass generation in QCD, so we all know very well QCD produces amazingly rich and uh, complicated structure, lots of different kinds of bond states. So I have indicated here uh, the conventional bound states, mesons and baryons, some of the exotic bound states, but in principle on a different level. So if you think about nuclei, then uh, those objects are actually kind of bound states made of made out of bound states. Of, of, uh, uh, microphone. microphone is not working. Yeah, okay. Okay. So now now it's better. Okay, all right, so uh, specifically in this talk, I will actually focus on uh, hadronic molecules, so we're talking about uh, sort of extended objects uh, uh, which can be interpreted as uh, bound states of, uh, in this case, uh, uh, charmed uh, uh, bottom uh, mesons. And specifically, I will be talking about this state, so that's a famous, uh, hidden charm state X3872 uh, with the quantum numbers one plus plus, which uh, has been first observed by the Bell collaboration already some, some time ago, and which resides amazingly close to the DD star threshold. And uh, I will also be talking about these two uh, charged states, uh, one plus minus ZB and uh, ZB prime. Uh, observed recently also by the Bell collaboration. So those are charged states. They cannot be made out of uh, uh, DD bar. And so those are truly exotic states. And so during my talk, I will make an assumption that we can understand the properties of these states uh, based on the molecular interpretation, which is more or less uh, extremely natural given the uh, enormous proximity to the corresponding threshold. I should also emphasize that, you know, this uh, Z states uh, decay predominantly in, into the elastic channels B, B, B star and B star, B star. All right, so actually molecular states. So you can uh, uh, refresh your memories from uh, chemistry. So if you have two nonpolar atoms, like helium atoms, then uh, what can happen is that, you, you know, because of the fluctuation of the charge distribution, you may spontaneously generate a kind of a dipole in one of the atoms. And so this will in, induce another dipole. And uh, then there is an attractive interaction, Van der Waals interaction, which is actually pretty weak. So in this case, it's uh, uh, not strong enough to produce helium to molecule, but for larger molecules, it, the effects are actually more pronounced. Now, uh, in a very much similar way, if you think about interaction between the two nucleons, then uh, it resembles pretty much, you know, similarity to this molecular picture. So for helium atoms, we have two electrically neutral uh, objects, atoms, which develop, you know, this Van der Waals interaction. For two nucleons, we have uh, two color neutral states, which, uh, interact with each other via exchange of, let's say, pi meson, rho meson, and so on. And so this strong interaction is also a residual uh, interaction uh, between this uh, uh, color neutral object. And in the case of nucleons, this residual interaction is actually strong enough to bind them to the deuteron, of course, as we know. Now, you may apply pretty much the same picture if you want to describe interaction between heavy mesons, and uh, that is basically the whole idea behind this talk. All right, so before talking about hadronic molecules uh, uh, like X and ZB states, let us actually talk a little bit about hadronic molecules, which we understand really very, very well. And so I'm talking about uh, shallow bound states in the, in the two-nucleon system. 
So here you can see phase shifts for nuclear-nuclear interaction in two S waves, spin triplet and spin singlet case. And now if you look at this picture, you immediately see, so because of the threshold behavior, phase shift has actually to grow linearly for, for S waves. Now you see there is an extremely large slope if you take a look at the phase shift near the threshold in both channels. And so this huge slope actually is nothing else but the very large scattering lengths, which you can see here in these numbers. So it is indeed extremely large if you compare it with the typical range of the interaction of the order of the inverse pion mass. Now this situation tells you that there should be poles in the S matrix which are located near the threshold. So it's telling you that basically in both channels the nuclear nuclear system is close to the so-called unitary limit. And uh, uh, we have indeed um, a bulk state which is a deuteron shallow bound state. And in the one is not channel, we have a virtual state. So just to remind you in the case of bound state, uh, the binding momentum has positive imaginary part. Uh, now for virtual states, uh, it has a negative imaginary part. So virtual state is located on the second ring machine. But still, if virtual state is located near the threshold, you can see that it can uh, strongly influence uh, phase shift and observables, of course. Now, uh, for systems near the unitary limit like we have here, one can actually make use of various kinds of effective field theories in order to uh, systematically dis describe uh, uh, certain universal features. And so in the case of nucleons, one can actually do the simplest possible approach in which uh, you just uh, build, build up your effective field theory based on nucleons alone. So that is what's called final CFT. But you can also do a little bit better by explicitly including pion degrees of freedom. That is what is called chiral effective field theory. All right, so let us now think about what kind of uh, effective field theory we can actually do for X and uh, for other uh, molecular states in the charmonium and botomonium systems. And so here you can see several or various thresholds which are relevant. So if you take a look at where the X resides, then you immediately recognize, okay, there is of course a very, uh, 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 very close uh, D0 to star zero threshold, but uh, there are also important threshold uh, where pine is involved, which are located, you know, just very close to the X within uh, basically ten tens of MeV. And so uh, this immediately tells you that presumably in order to correctly describe the physics of the X, you actually, your effective field theory should necessarily involve pions. So you can still do kind of pionless effective field theory using only DD star mesons as degree of freedom, but your EFT would be then limited to extremely narrow energy range. So it should better include pions in this case because of the proximity of these thresholds. And so you can see different formulations that people are using uh, in those cases, pional CFT. Now, XFT is a kind of chiral FT approach where pion dynamics is uh, taken into account perturbatively. And uh, I will be mostly talking about the couple channel chiral effective field theory approach where we try to take into account pion, pion physics in a non perturbative way. Now, there is one specific feature, or actually two specific features, if you compare the situation here and in the case of the nuclear nuclear system. One complication is, as I mentioned already, the appearance of this uh, uh, DD pi channels, which immediately tells you that three body physics should be important in this case. The second interesting feature is that uh, uh, in this case, we actually can also benefit from using heavy quark spin and flavor symmetries, which we don't have in the case of uh, nuclear forces. And this has also nice applications, like, which allows us to predict, uh, for example, spin partner states. Okay, so now I'll start with the lessons, but I, I, I will start now with lesson zero, because I will first, you know, b before discussing EFTs for molecular states, I would like to um, talk about a li little bit about a textbook example of such an EFT in the case of uh, 
nuclear systems. So the approach is pretty much the same, but it's much simpler because uh, there is uh, no need to incorporate a couple channel dynamics, three-body physics, and uh, it is also nice because one has a huge amount of experimental data, so it's not a problem to tune the low energy constants and to really make this approach into a precision framework. So I will use this example you know, to show you how uh, effective field theory of chiral FT can be constructed and then uh, move on to discussing hadronic molecules. Okay, so the basic idea behind chiral perturbation theory is to exploit the approximate chiral symmetry of QCD. Now, if uh, quarks would be exactly massless, then the uh, chiral symmetry of the QCD Lagrangian would be exact, but we also know that it is spontaneously broken so the axion generators are broken, and so this means that we should observe actually a spectrum pseudo-scale of mesons. So either three such pseudo-scale of Goldstone bosons in the SU2 case or eight bosons in the SU3 case, which would be exactly massless if quarks uh, would be massless as well. So in the case of exact chiral symmetry, the situation is very simple. So uh, the spectrum of QCD contains massless particles, Goldstone bosons, and this helps uh, us theories a lot because uh, the interaction of Goldstone bosons is very well known to be perturbative if you go to very low energies. So Goldstone bosons couple uh, with derivatives and this means that if you go to very low energies, then the interaction between Goldstone bosons disappears. So if, if current symmetry would be exact, and if you would go you know, to zero energies, then uh, you are basically turning to a uh, non-interacting quantum field theory. And the whole idea of current perturbation theory is to exploit this fact in a systematic way by making an expansion of hadronic observables simultaneously around the chiral limit and uh, making a derivative expansion, which actually translates into expansion in powers of momenta or energies. So the expansion parameter is this ratio of momenta uh, of the order of m pi divided by some hadronic scale, like uh, mass of the Rom meson, something of the order of 1 GeV. And uh, uh, chiral perturbation theory is nothing, but expansion of hadronic observables in this parameter. So the practical way, the easiest practical way to end up with this expansion is to make use of the effective Lagrangian. So you just write down all possible terms where pions, Goldstone bosons are involved and also matter fields which you need like nucleons in this case or heavy mesons if you want to describe physics of X, for example. And uh, you can see that, you know, uh, so, so this upper index corresponds to the number of derivatives, essentially, and so your effective Lagrangian involves infinite number of terms, and every term is multiplied with a low energy constants like ci, di. So those low energy constants um, essentially show our ignorance of short-range physics. So if, if we would be able to solve QCD, then we could, in principle, calculate those low energy constants. Otherwise, uh, you can tune them to experimental data. The advantage of the effective Lagrangian is that it is really universal. So you can use the same effective Lagrangian to describe all processes with the corresponding degrees of freedom. All right, so this is now how chiral expansion works in the case of, so that's a classical example, again, textbook example of nuclear scattering. So here you start you know, classifying your Feynman diagrams according to uh, the uh, expansion parameter. So at leading order, you have these three level diagrams uh, from the lowest order effective Lagrangian, which only involves this GA coupling. And then at higher orders, you start being sensitive to the low energy constants from the higher order effective Lagrangians, which you have to determine from experimental data. And so here you see that if you go to higher and higher order, then you can end up with more and more precise description of experimental data. In this case, these are just Feynman diagrams. I'm talking about kind of perturbation theory, and uh, you know we we are calculating this Feynman diagrams, the amplitude, and then out of this amplitude we calculate the differential cross section in this case oh, for pi nuclear. In this case, it's pure pure kind of perturbation theory. Which is Feynman diagrams. So you can easily uh, see, you know, the 
the powers of these diagrams. Every vertex involves, so GA vertex involves one derivative, and then there is uh, one power of Q in the denominator because of the heavy barium propagator. So this is order Q, Q1, and so you can easily see, convince yourself that uh, the ordering scheme uh, is uh, correctly reproduced here. Okay, now uh, if you now add an additional nucleon, so I have two nucleons, then things immediately start becoming more complicated. So as I mentioned already, uh, the interaction of Goldstone bosons with themselves, but also with metal fields are, is suppressed if you go to low energy, so this coupling involves a derivative. But if you have two nucleons, and if you're looking at this diagram, then you have two derivatives from the vertices, but you have also prime propagator, which scales as Q minus two. So immediately, the naive dimensional analysis tells you that this diagram scales as order one. And the same holds true also for this contact interaction, which is not at all suppressed by the current symmetry in the low, low energy region. So while interaction of Goldstone bosons with meta fields is suppressed, there is no suppression for interaction between meta fields themselves. And of course, we also know very well that the interaction between nucleons is strong enough to produce bound states. So this clearly tells you that, uh, of course, a naive perturbative approach will not work, and it's not justified here, so you need a kind of resummation. Certain contributions to the amplitude need to be resummed up to an infinite order in order to generate poles in the amplitude, obviously. And so the easiest way to do it is by, um, had suggested by Weinberg, by uh, uh, casting your calculation into the form of the Schrodinger theory, where you essentially derive you know, the potentials which are shown here schematically and then uh, calculate observables by solving the uh, integral equation like lippmann schwinger equation, Fadeev equation, or whatever. Okay, so in the simplest ap approach, remember I mentioned that in principle, if you're only interested in, let's say, the properties of the deuteron at extremely low energies. Now, the deuteron binding momentum is only of the order of 40 MeV, so it's still a factor of three smaller than the pion mass. Why do we need pions? In principle, if you're only interested in the neutron, you don't need pions, so you can consider the simplest effective field theory, pionless CFT, which only incorporates uh, such contact interactions. The advantage of this formulation is that it is extremely simple, so you can do calculations analytically, scattering amplitude at leading quarters, so if you only iterate this derivativeless interaction, then you immediately see that whatever iterations you do, you will always generate the same divergence, which is absorbable into the same low energy constant. So the leading quarter amplitude, even though being calculated non-perturbatively, is renormalizable, and you can include higher order corrections perturbatively in order to you know, maintain renormalizability. Of course, if, 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 if you will start iterating next to leading on a short range um, operator, then you, you would need, an, in principle, an infinite number of counter jumps. Now, if you want to do better and include pions, then uh, historically people first tried actually to include pions perturbatively, so that is a so-called W approach which uh, keeps all these nice features of final CFT. It's renormalizable, you can do analytical calculations, beautiful results, but unfortunately it doesn't converge for nuclear-nuclear um, uh, uh, -nuclear scattering. So this means that you must actually include physics non-perturbatively, and this is immediately much more difficult. So the problem is that, uh, which you can see obviously, you know, from these ladder diagrams, so this is your lippmann schwinger equation. And so, that one pion exchange scales in the ultraviolet, as you can see, as a constant, which means that if you will iterate, you know, the one pion exchange, you will generate ultraviolet divergences of ever increasing dimension. And so this means that, strictly speaking, in every spin triplet states, you actually need an infinite number of counter terms if you want to absorb all of the divergences. So you have to subtract this and this uh, is not possible as far as I know. And so therefore, the traditional approach is to introduce a regulator which has to be kept finite. So you have to leave in this case 
with a finite cutoff, and then, of course, you know, the observables which you calculate show a residual cutoff dependence which becomes smaller and smaller if you go to higher orders. So this is just one example of uh, how one can, uh, one has actually pushed this theory in the recent years to amazingly high orders, in this case in Forelio. So these are our calculations where you can see so the uh, various chiral orders. In this case, we are looking at uh, 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 neutron proton scattering observables at intermediate energy, uh, and uh, basically the red band is our final result in this case. And band indicates an estimated truncation error. You can see theory is extremely precise, but I should also mention that at this order, so at this level, for LO, you, you actually have 27 short range operators. Which uh, whose strengths have to be determined from an ex experiment. Fortunately, in this case, there are a huge number of experimental data, so this is not a problem. But obviously, you cannot do the same thing um, uh, for hadronic molecules, at least at least at the moment. So this is just to show you that you can use actually this effective field theory to make really precision physics. I should also mention that uh, our uh, interactions produce actually the best. Um, uh, uh, available description of nuclear nucleon data below the prime production threshold. Sure. How can I see that I see clear evidence of chiral chiral? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So uh, you can see it in the following way. Um, no. Uh, the chiral expansion of the contact operators comes always with two powers of momentum. So you have contact operator, you have no contact in interactions at leading order, order Q0, then you have two more at NLO, you have again two more and so on. But the chiral expansion of the two pion exchange goes actually also with odd powers of momentum. So therefore, you can compare the description of the data at order Q squared and at order Q cubed, where the only additional ingredient is higher order two pi exchange. And you see beautiful improvement. You can also compare the results at order Q4 and Q fifths, which is N4 LO. And again, in a parameter way, you can see beautiful improvement in the description of the data. That's really convincing evidence, okay? All right, so now uh, let me move on to hadronic molecules. And uh, so I will begin with uh, uh, discussing the chiral dynamics of the X. And uh, so here are the questions we're interested in. So what is the role of quantum physics uh, for the X? How can one perform uh, chiral extrapolation? So Several uh, latest QCD groups are interested in calculate, you know, states, but the calculations are usually done in heavy quark masses because otherwise it's too expensive. So we need a kind of chiral extrapolations of this result. And uh, of course, also the question of whether one can treat pi and exchange perturbatively. Now, naively, of course, uh, you could say, well, we can immediately ask the question if uh, one pi exchange is enough to bind actually the 2D mesons in the X. So that is in fact how several groups have, uh, you know, addressed this problem. Unfortunately, this is a little bit too naive because, you know, the one pi exchange has this singular one of acute tensor interaction, which uh, cannot be used directly in a Schrodinger equation. So you have to, in order to produce meaningful results, you have to introduce a regularization or renormalization scale. And depending on how you choose your regulator, of course, the role of the fine uh, will become different. So you need more sophisticated ways to address, you know, the importance of uh, pine dynamics. Okay, so the effective field theory is essentially the same as in the case uh, for the nucleons. So instead of nucleons, we have here D and D star mesons coupled with the pion. Everything I've been talking about uh, is uh, leading order, so you only need this uh, leading order Lagrangian with a single Lagrangian constant, which uh, can be determined from the uh, decay width of d star into uh, d pi. And uh, uh, so the approach you end up with is shown by this uh, uh, coupled equation for the scattering amplitude for dd star mesons. 
And uh, so you can see, so lambdas are known isospin factors which I omit. So the sine and ten prime are at the end of the day contracted with the polarization uh, indices of the D star mesons in the initial and final states. And so here the important thing is that you have this propagator. And as I mentioned already, remember very differently to the nuclear nuclear case where one can use a static pion propagator, so the pion energy is basically zero. In this case, pion can actually become on shell. So it's very important to take into account you know, three body cut. Otherwise, uh, um, you will not be able to generate the correct properties of the amplitude. So at leading quarter, we have actually only a single low energy constants, C0, which needs to be determined from data, like you know, the assumed binding energy of Zx. But I will also be talking about you know, uh, chiral extrapolations going to unphysical prime mass. And here we will uh, need another parameter, F, uh, which basically controls you know, chiral extrapolations of a short range operator. So strictly speaking, this parameter um, uh, would not be needed if I would be able to perform a renormalization correctly. So you can view it as an artifact of the feature that I can completely uh, eliminate my regulator. I will come back to this point later on. So for chiral extrapolations at leading quarter in this approach, I need two parameters. So before going to chiral extrapolations, uh, here you can see uh, calculation by Vadim and collaborators uh, for the partial decay Vs of X into DD pi. And so here you can see, so in this case we have just one parameter because everything is in the physical uh, quark masses. And so this red line uh, is our result depending on the binding energy, assumed binding energy of the X. And here you can see that if you would now make a static approximation for the pion, so this is this green line, you will be completely off. So this immediately tells you that you know, three-body dynamics is really important. On the other hand, you can compare our results with perturbative inclusion of pions in XAFT calculations by Volosian and Fleming et al. And you can see that the agreement is reasonable. So in this particular case, perturbative pions seem to work well. Now let's uh, move on to the chiral extrapolation of the X. And so uh, here I show how the, unfortunately this uh, laser point, pointer is dead, I guess. Oh, okay. So I'm showing here the binding energy, how it changes with the variation of the quark or equivalent point masses. And uh, so, this is a physical point where I have to make an assumption about the binding energy of the X. And so since we have two parameters, I also need a slope uh, of the of changing of the binding energy at, at the physical point, for example, as a second parameter. So I will be using just two particular values, negative slope, which is shown by this red uh, band and line and positive one, which is a black line. And so what you see is that latest QCD data, the available latest QCD data, actually suggest that the slope should be negative. Now you can see here our result for chiral extrapolation shown in this red band. And uh, now again, we can make the same game. We just switch off pions and see what happens. And you can see that you would be completely off. So again, pions are really important here. On the other hand, in a different scenario, if you would have you know, this uh, positive slope, black lines, then pion dynamics would actually not be that important. Now you also see that at leading quarter, I'm producing actually a band, not a line. So this band has to do with the fact that I do still have a residual regulator dependence. So the band corresponds to a variation of the cutoff in a certain range. And of course, the question is, well, can one maybe do a better thing? Can one end up with a renormalizable approach where you can really completely eliminate uh, the ultraviolet cutoff? And the answer is yes. And uh, 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 in fact, once again, to remind you, the problem emerges from the, from the fact that the Lichtenschwinger equation is a linearly divergent, as you can see here. So this is the same problem has also occurs for nuclear nuclear scattering. Now with jumble Gigele, we have actually found that uh, uh, the non-renormalizability of the Lippmann-Schwinger equation is actually a consequence of uh, 
making a non-relativistic expansion at the level of the Lagrangian or, uh, or ingredients entering this integral equation. So if you would start with a relativistic approach, you can easily convince yourself you cannot generate linearly divergent integral equations. So it would be only logarithmically divergent. And so the idea is that, well, why don't we make calculations in this relativistic framework? But still, of course, we don't really want to solve a Peter Sorry Peter equation. So we actually use this three-dimensional equation which has a correct unitarity, uh, relativistic unitarity. And so this equation is known as Kardashevsky equation. And so if you, as you see immediately compared with the Schwinger equation, this equation is only logarithmically divergent, which means that you know, this later iteration of pions will only produce logarithmic divergence and your leading order amplitude is exactly renormalizable. So in this case, one can completely eliminate the regulator. And uh, in fact, that leading order, one then obtains uh, a parameter-free prediction for the binding energy of X because, you know, the whole uh, m pi dependence is governed by the one, one, one pi exchange. And so you see that at leading quarter, one ends up with a conclusion that X should disappear, actually, if you increase the pi mass. This is the same thing that is also observed, uh, you know, for the deuteron, and the, the explanation is very simple. So the one pi exchange has only very weak S-wave interaction, but it had a strong tensor interaction. And so the strong tensor interaction produces an effective attractive force for S to S transition via the D state transition. Now, if you make pine heavier, then you basically decrease the impact of the one pine exchange, then the attraction decreases, and then at some point, you know, um, uh, your bound state disappears. However, the problem with this is that for um, systems near the unitary limit, which are really fine-tuned, you can actually show that your higher order corrections next to leading order corrections to the interaction are enhanced. So the uncertainty of this leading order calculation is very large, and you definitely need to go to next to leading order. And this is shown here in this plot. So this line, dashed line, is our next to leading order calculation, where we include the next to leading order correction perturbatively. And again, everything is exactly renormalizable. There is no cutoff here, nothing. And uh, this is a result of final CFT at next to leading order. Again, you can see it doesn't work. And we also try to include, you know, uh, next to leading short range operator non perturbatively. But in order to make it in the way <laughs> compatible with renormalizability, we have actually made use of resonance saturation hypothesis. So you basically model this next to leading quarter short range operator via exchange of, let's say, a row or other mesons. And then by variation of the mass, you produce, you know, your chiral extrapolations. So again, you can see, so we played also the same game, but now inversely, imagine that you have latest data here, and then you want to describe X in the physical uh, case. And so if you do it with dynamical pines, you obtain this red band. Static pines would produce this extrapolation. So you clearly see the importance of you know, the dynamical inclusion of pions. Now in the last couple of minutes, I would like to talk a little bit about spin partners. Uh, and I start with spin partners of the X. So it's very well known that the isospin and heavy quark spin symmetries constrain actually uh, strongly the S wave interactions between D and D star mesons. Okay, at the end of the day, you have only two independent short range operators there. And so this immediately uh, makes possible predictions for spin partner states which people have done, of course, since uh, many, e many years. Now, the question is, uh, if you will switch on pines explicitly, how would these results be affected by the pine dynamics? And that is what we want to study. So here I, I'm showing you the relevant uh, S wave D and D star states. So zero plus plus, one plus minus, and vector and tensor states. And uh, those are all S wave states which you will have if you would do pineless CFT only contact interaction, because at leading quarter there are no coupling to partial wave other than S waves. And as I mentioned already, in the strict heavy 
work limit where the D, and D star mesons are degenerate, you would actually have uh, uh, you know, partner states of the X. So you have these four states, but you may also have uh, two additional degenerate states depending on whether the strength of the interaction is uh, sufficient to produce a bond state. So that is a situation in the pine, in pine or CFT. Now if you switch on pines, then well, pine can actually couple S waves uh, to D waves, of course, and uh, so you get a much more complicated problem. And at, at first, it's not at all clear that you know this strict heavy work limit of pine CFT will survive. Now we have actually shown analytically that uh, in fact the uh, the uh, uh, conclusion of the strict heavy quark limit from pineless EFT stays intact upon including the pine exchange. But in order to uh, reach at this conclusion, it is really necessary to keep you know, all these partial waves. If you will try making an approximation and you know, uh, neglect one of these uh, partial waves, then your results, you would immediately lose uh, renormalizability and get you know, deviations from the strict heavy core symmetry. That is an important observation because exactly uh, such kind of approximations are done sometimes by other people. Now, of course, uh, strict heavy work limit is not really realized. We know that the D and D star mesons are not really degenerate. Unfortunately, going beyond the heavy work limit is tricky because you know the mass is splitting Unfortunately, it generates a fairly large momentum scale, which we have to treat in a soft scale. So at the end of the day, the uncertainty of field calculations becomes large. But here you can see the most prominent uh, effect which we observed between pineless and pine full calculations. So here I'm showing you the predicted uh, tensor spin partner state of the X. And uh, so you can see that if pine dynamics is included, then uh, we get much more bounce state, and you also generate a decay width, which uh, the, so these features are absent in a purely contact interaction. So the final uh, uh, couple of slides uh, have to do with partner states of Z, ZB and ZB prime. So uh, in principle, one can play exactly the same game now for these bottomonium-like states. Uh, and that is, of course, what uh, various people have done, including ourselves. So you use exactly the same framework to predict you know, all the states. But again, we would actually then have to make assumptions about the binding energies of ZB and ZB prime. A better approach would be to use experimental data on line shapes, which are actually available in those channels, and fit you know, our EFT directly to these line shapes, and then we can make statements about you know, the nature of ZB, ZB prime, where the bound state, virtual states, resonances, and we can make statements about the partner states, including producing line shapes. And so this is exactly the approach which we followed very recently. So in this uh, preprint, which is uh, just a couple of months old, here I'm showing you here the fits that we have done for line shapes in the two elastic uh, channels B B star B star B star, but also in the inelastic channels of uh, Botomonia and pions. So all feeds produce uh, excellent chi squared, and uh, we are able to determine all our low energy constants, all our parameters out of these feeds. So this blue feed is actually pineless EFT. It is not that good as you know fits where pions are included, shown you know by this red and black line. So our final result correspond to these black lines. And then uh, we uh, have made in this preprint uh, predictions for you know line shapes, again in elastic and also inelastic channels, botomonia and pions, for all the partner states, for all plus plus, so J plus plus states. As an example, here what we obtained for the tensor channel, so here you can see the vertical line is a B star, B star threshold, and so we predict here really pronounced enhancement so uh, associated with the partner states. And you can see that actually the partner states in this case uh, show up as above threshold resonances. 
So if you would have a virtual state, then the pattern would be different. I mean, you would typically get an enhanced cusp or something, but not, you know, this resonance-like structure. In fact, what we found is that also that B and that B prime also correspond to above threshold resonances. So that's our results. And uh, they can be nicely tested uh, by the new uh, L2 collaboration, for example, in a uh, uh, radiative decays of upsilon 10, 860. So in principle, you have an additional penalty because of the electromagnetic interaction, but since it's st statistics is going really to be very high, then uh, I think that you know observation of these pattern states should be possible, would be extremely interesting. By the way, we have also made calculations using final CFT for these partner states, and there the conclusion is that in final CFT, all these partner states show up as virtual states, not as, not as resonances. So the pattern of line shape is really very much difficult, uh, different. Depend on the, yes. Yeah, I cannot uh, answer yet, I mean, this question immediately, yeah. But we we just do you know, PDG information. If you yeah. change the model? We can certainly, certainly play this game, yeah, and see what will happen. So conclusions, uh, I uh, hope I have convinced you that one can do really lots of interesting stuff and understand, you know, this exotic molecular states in a framework of effective field theory. I uh, argued that pan, pan cloud effects are important for X and also ZB, ZB prime states. Moreover, for the X, three body dynamics is really uh, mandatory, so you cannot really replace pan exchange by static. This will not work. I mean, you really need a three body cut. We have um, made predictions for uh, J plus plus partners states so of ZB, ZB prime, which can be tested and held. Um, held to. And of course, now one can play the same game for X, making predictions for the partner states. And this can be hopefully nicely measured in precise energy scans at Panda. Thank you very much for your attention. So, yeah, so the problem is, that first of all, currently in the charmonium sector, the situation with the line shapes is not that, that good as in the botomonium sector. So we really need more and more precise uh, data. Secondly, uh, charmonium is certainly more difficult because, as I mentioned, the amount of the heavy core spin, spin symmetry that you expect is larger, of course. In fact, we have seen that, you know, in the botomonium sector, the effects beyond the exact you know, having work uh, symmetry, if you go, you know, apart from masses, so the corrections on the interactions are tiny and can be neglected completely. In the charmonium sector, this will presumably not be the case. So it's, um, it's more difficult, for sure. And as always, a problem is the amount of experimental information to, you know, constrain low energy data. I have one, uh, one question concerning your theory. If your theory would work as well if you add, instead of a light force, to the charm force a strange force. So, you know, there are, there are different thresholds as well. So yeah. if you have a D, D sub S, D sub S bar, yeah. or we, something yeah. like that, would that change anything? Actually, we are working on the generalization to the strange sector. That's a very, very interesting topic. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so the best calculations that we have done were shown uh, where I was talking about the chiral extrapolation of the X in this renormalizable approach where we are solving basically the Kardashevsky equation. The problem is that, you know, this relativized approach is uh, <coughs> computationally much more demanding. So it's uh, uh, very <coughs> It's much, much more difficult to do calculations. And that is, in fact, the main reason that for the study of the partner states, we have actually used this non-relativistic approach. But uh, definitely, so using this um, relativistic version, which we have e used based on the Kardashevsky equation is an option. Peter Sal Peter would probably be uh, very welcome, but I cannot judge, you know, how easy <laughs> one can do calculations in this case. So, <laughs> this can help, yes. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I will not present you something about physics. I will not uh, to try it. Um, it's, uh, now the institutional part of the workshop, uh, but I think it's uh, also interesting for you uh, to know about uh, what we are doing in Sao Paulo with our German Center for Research and Innovation, uh, who are we? And I have uh, invited as well uh, my colleagues from the ED, the German Academic Exchange Service, Anna Backhausen, and the director of the German Research Foundation, DFG, Katrin Winkler. They are arriving, still arriving, they tell me. Uh, so I will start and they will uh, present after my presentation the funding programs uh, from the AD and from the FG. Okay. So they are the Anna Backhauser from the AD, she will speak after me. And Catherine is coming as well. Okay. So uh, we are five uh, German research, uh, German Centers for Research and Innovation uh, worldwide. This is an initiative of uh, the German government uh, by the Foreign Office uh, in uh, cooperation with representation of the scientific organizations in Germany and representatives of uh, companies of business. Okay. So we are five uh, houses or centers worldwide. Besides Sao Paulo's, we have uh, the VIH, as we uh, say, spell 
our acronym in, 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 in German. In German is easier than in Portuguese or in English. DWIH, it's more complicated than DVH. And uh, so I will not translate in DVH, it's easier. Uh, so besides Sao Paulo, we have New York in small school, New Delhi and Tokyo. So here is Kathleen, she will speak after me as well. So, and uh, this network is part of the German science foreign policy. And after uh, an implementation phase uh, in which, uh, which uh, DVH uh, worked very alone uh, uh, with independence, we are all five centers since 2017 under the umbrella of the DED. And we have now an institutional funding for medium and large uh, time. So, and uh, the, 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 DVH, the DVHs are platforms. We are physical platforms with offices uh, of many uh, German organizations. As you see here, these are the, the full supporters of the house. Uh, they, they have representatives direct in Brazil, okay? We can come to us and speak directly uh, with the representatives of the institutions, the funding agencies, DAD, Anna Backhausen, uh, DFG, Catherine uh, Winkler, and her team, uh, the Alexander von Hund Foundation, I will present you uh, the funding progress of the Humboldt Foundation for you, it's very important. Uh, then we have representatives of the universities, Freie Universität Berlin, Technical University Munich, Munich University uh, Potsdam, and University uh, Münster, and the three universities of the uh, University, University Alliance Ruhr, uh, the University of Bochum, uh, uh, University of Bochum is one of them, okay? Um, yes, and they're from Hofer as, as the most uh, important uh, apparent research organization in Europe. And GAST, this is an organization for German uh, tests, language. So, and we have also associated supporters. So, associated supporters are organizations, they don't have uh, representatives in Brazil, but they are, um, they work close uh, to us uh, and participate in our uh, meetings uh, through video conference and uh, they take part in, the, in our decisions and our definition of, of our program, of our activities. You can see some of them there. And we have also then uh, not only universities, but also two representations of states uh, in, in Germany, Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg, and Max Planck Society and Leibniz Association. So, and what we do? So, we, our goals are to promote exchange of knowledge, what you are doing here with your workshop, to promote scientific cooperation. I hope you continue to cooperate or to start or to, to be bigger or larger in your cooperation. Uh, with Panda, FIA, and, and all these groups. Uh, so we are interested as well to promote cooperation, science and business. And we do marketing for Germany, uh, as in this moment, uh, as a land of ideas. And we give you information and advice about uh, studies and research and research cooperation with Germany. 
and how we do it. So we have our own events uh, for that. Our main uh, event is the German-Brazilian dialogue on science, research, and innovation. We, we uh, realize this uh, event uh, every year with FAPESB as partner here in Sao Paulo. Last year, our uh, topic was working and learning in a digital world. This year, it will be um, a perspective of prevention of conflict and violence. So we work very, very, how I say broad? No? So, uh, um, so we, we work with, with all top subjects. Uh, there is no uh, limitation for that. So we are, you can find us every year on the SPPC annual meeting here in Brazil. The SPPC for the people from abroad is the Brazilian Society for the Advance of Science. And uh, every year we organize with SPPC a round table. Last year we have discussed the impacts of digitalization on higher education research. And uh, with the German Chamber, uh, German Brazilian Chamber in Sao Paulo, we organize every year the German Brazilian Innovation Congress, bringing uh, German speakers from uh, research area uh, to promote uh, cooperation with, 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 with the companies. Uh, also with uh, the German Chamber, we, we work together in this initiative, Startups Connected. It's a competition and we uh, give a, a prize and award to a German startup that is interested to, to come to Brazil, to cooperate with Brazil or, or maybe uh, to start a business in Brazil as well. In the last two years, or in the first two years, we, we had uh, startups in the area of Agro 4.0, digital agriculture as winners. Uh, the following ones lab is also a competition from, of new ideas from young researchers, and the two uh, winners from Brazil, they go to the final uh, round in, in Berlin. In this final round, there are 100, 100 young researchers from all uh, the world. Uh, so, now I resume a summary. So, what we can do for you? So, inform and advise about research opportunities, about funding opportunities. Uh, and we can uh, be partner uh, of events and projects like this case uh, to, today. Okay? Uh, if you, for, this is a answer for the Brazilian researchers here. If you work together with German uh, partners from one of our uh, supporters, these colleagues from these uh, institutions can apply. Uh, for a funding, uh, for a support for an event, a workshop, congress, conference, summer school, uh, many models, formats. So I want to recommend you as well to visit our website, obviously, to sign our newsletter in order that you uh, receive uh, uh, information about new uh, funding programs uh, and so on, grants and so on. So we are also on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. Yes, this is the first part of my presentation that I want to present some funding programs that the, my colleagues will not present. No? So. But I will not go uh, deeply in the presentation. So the, the Humboldt Foundation 
it's a very important organization uh, for you, for the Brazilian researchers and the German researchers, I think they know the Humboldt Foundation. Uh, so there are um, the, core, the core of the work of the uh, Humboldt Foundation is uh, grants for uh, postdocs and for senior researchers. Okay, these are this is this program with CAPES in Brazil. Okay, there are some others, but I think there is no important uh, for you today. So the uh, the CAPES Humboldt Research Fellowships programs. Okay, it's. Uh, it's a sponsorship for people, not for projects. Okay, if you are a good researcher, you can apply for for the these grants, for these fellowships. Okay, and uh, you can have more information about uh, this program with the representatives of the uh, Humboldt Foundation Brazil, and one of one of them is a physician, and um, a physician physic. Sorry, uh, is the Professor Leonardo de Souza Menezes in Pernambuco? I don't know if you know him. He's no, maybe not. It's, his uh, area is optoelectronics and quantic electronic. I think it's other area, <laughs> but he's, he can help you uh, and advise you about. Uh, these programs, or you can here in São Paulo, you can ask uh, Professor Conrado and the faculty uh, of law uh, at USP. Okay, the contacts are all in our uh, website, and uh, the ones that uh, have gotten this one uh, from the table, there the contacts are here as well. And Bailat. Bailat is the representative of Baviaria. They has, uh, the, the Bailat has three, three uh, funding programs. One of them is for, for research projects, okay? Uh, the other one uh, is with FAPESP to promote workshops as well, is in the, um, is uh, in the frame of this uh, call uh, sprint from, from FAPESP. I think the, the, the colleagues from Sao Paulo know sprint from FAPESP. And uh, they have, uh, Bailat has as well scholarships for students from Latin America to go to Bavaria for one to five months. Okay, if you are interested. And so here are some uh, websites uh, to visit if you are interesting. interested. So research in Germany, academics.com, Jared, I, I think Catherine can explain more about it. Uh, the, the, Anna will explain. In our website, we publish as well the opportunities from Europe, from the European Union. That was uh, from my side. So here are my contacts, and uh, I will be uh, until the end of, I think, of this afternoon here. Okay. Thank you very much, and I will invite then Anna Backhausen for a presentation about the programs of the AD. Thank you. Eu vou tirar esse passar para cá. Sim. E aí esse entra aqui. Obrigada. Pode.
そう。あのそのの Um, my name is Anna Barkhausen, I'm the coordinator. No, my name is Anna Barkhausen, sorry. <laughs> Wrong language.、Um, my name is Anna Barkhausen, I'm the、uh, head of the DID Information Center. And I will speak about, a little bit about the DID, about DID project funding opportunities and DID scholarship programs. I guess we have some German researchers here. And Brazilian researchers and any other nationality?、Oh, where are you from? Sweden. Okay, maybe some programs are not so interesting <laughs> for you, but anyway.、Um, so, about the DID, I guess、uh, German researchers know the DID quite well.、Um, we are a self governing organization of German universities funded by a federal German ministry like the Ministry of Federal Affairs. The Foreign Affairs, no, the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs,、uh, the Federal Ministry of Science and Education, and the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development.、Um, what do we do in general? What are our tasks? We give scholarships, we、um, support structures for internationalization, and we offer expertise for academic. Collaboration. So here you have some, some numbers.、Um, maybe the most important ones are here. My last, my, my last numbers are from 2017. So we have individual funding、um, and project funding. You see, the DID funds Germans and Brazilians, and there are more、uh, Brazilians coming to Germany than Germans coming to. Brazil. I hope that will be, one day will be balanced, but well, we are working on it.、Um, another map. We like to show maps. Marcio did it as well.、Um, here in Brazil, we have、um, the information office I already mentioned in Sao Paulo, and we have a bigger unit,、um, the、uh, Regional office in Rio de Janeiro、uh, since 1973, something like that. So we are very well represented in Brazil. It's our most important partner in South America. In general, what we do, of course, like today, we give him,、uh, information about study and research in Germany. We inform about our scholarships. We give scholarships to Brazilians as well as to Germans, but here I guess for you more important are the Brazilian part.、Uh, we support university corporations and also we have funding for bilateral research projects. And if you are, you are a German professor and you want to come to、uh, Brazil, please do so. We will support you. We have also funding for this. Uh, first, the second part is about project funding opportunities.、Um, here we have PROBRAL, or PPP, Programm mit Projektbezogener Personenaustausch. This is a program、uh, together with CAPES. And、um, the DID gives money for exchange. So it's a German academic exchange service.、Um, normally, we give the money for mobility. We do not have So much money for、uh, your new computer or something like that. But if you have a, a, pro,、um, a research project and you want to exchange、uh, PhD students or postdocs, that could be interesting. The next call will be in May, and the Germans apply to the DID, and the Brazilians apply to,、um, to CAPS. But right now we have an actual、um, call for it's maybe, it's nearly the same, but it's with Vapespi. So if you're from a,、um, from a university in Sao Paulo, from UNESPI, or I've seen there somebody from UFABC, I guess, or from、um, USPI, 
That could be interesting um, also for joint research project. You can apply and you will get money for um, exchange. And it's for two years and you can apply for another two years, so up to four years. And the deadline is by the end of April. So there's still time. Now, uh, end of April. Both. <laughs> it's the same deadline. Oh. And she said 29th of March. Oh, I'm sorry. So I have to look it up because I looked it up today and I copied it, I guess. And sorry. I, I, <laughs> sorry. No, but if you, if you, um, could be, it could be a. Oh, yeah. Okay. So. Oh, the, it's not good. <laughs> this should be the same <laughs> deadline. I, I will look it up. I'm, I'm sorry for this mis misunderstanding. <laughs> so Fapesti says April and Fapohat says March. Uh, no, I, I will I will look it up and, and then maybe I will write an email to uh, Mrs. Pohat to Pay that they should be the same. No, that's. Ah, okay, but that's a, that's a, that's for Pesby. But he talked with the German, with my German colleague, who's responsible for the German side. And if the Germans have to hand in the uh, application a little bit sooner, that would be strange. <laughs> that's uh, I have to check it on the DID website and. But thank you for the information, so I'm not totally wrong. <laughs> okay, sorry, this is all in Portuguese. I forgot to change it. <laughs> yeah, but the Germans. <laughs> so it's learn Portuguese, it's wonderful, it's a wonderful language. Um, CAPES, uh, the Brazilian uh, funding agency, CAPES has a program called PRINT. And um, it's for the internationalization of research at uh, federal, mainly, no, not only federal universities, at Brazilian research, Brazilian universities doing research. And um, DRD has some money for German PhD students who want to do part of their studies, part of their uh, research in Brazil. For this, you should be a partner and you should be mentioned um, in the print application. So right now it's not too clear because the DID ha hasn't got all the information about which university, which German universities will take part in the print project. But anyway, if you already know, you are from a German university, yes, we are cooperating um, with, in, with uh, this university, with print, then maybe, and you have a PhD student, so you could send the person to, to Brazil. Oh, there is some funding, possible funding, at least. Okay, um, I mentioned here um, Probral e Propaspi, they are bilateral programs, but there are some programs where only the German university can apply to. These are fact-finding missions, so they're... Um, a group from, from a German university can visit Brazilian university to see how can we work together, what could we do together, which kind of project. Um, this is funded by the Federal Ministry of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. And this is a program for developing countries. In Sao Paulo, I guess, uh, maybe this that knows, does not apply, but it's possible to um, to be a candidate for this and could be interesting. And also, uh, we have subject-related partnerships with institutions of higher education in developing countries. As I said, this part of Brazil maybe is not so, not really a developing country, but it's still Brazil as in, in whole is on this list and it's eligible for this. So they, they will fund uh, cooperation between higher education institutions 
And um, if you do a fact-finding mission, the aim is to do uh, apply also for one of, of uh, for, for example, for this program, a subject-related partnership. Can be in physics. Okay, this is more ESRP, International Study and Training Partnerships. This is more for the exchange of bachelor or master students, if you're interested uh, in the exchange of, of students. Um, this, there's also there's money for German students and also uh, money for Brazilian students. Um, it's, not, it's not a full, full scholarship, but it's 400 euros that already may help. After this cooperation with the ESIP program, you could think about integrated international degree programs with double degree. So the DID also funds double degree programs if you have already an ongoing exchange um, with one with your partner, German partner, with your Brazilian partner university, because only here also only the German university can apply. You could think about a double degree program. Also, um, the DID funds summer schools in a foreign country, so it will be funded lecturers from German universities teaching in a summer school. Maybe you could, uh, the, also only the German university can apply to this, but could be also interesting. Okay, now I will come to individual funding, and I will, I guess, uh, I will, I will, now I will speak more for the Brazilians. Um, are there any uh, PhD students here. Who's doing a PhD? No? M master? Master? Okay. So maybe for you. <laughs> we have uh, scholarships. It's a joint call of CAPES and DID. For, and there are three possibilities to do, to get a scholarship. You would do the full PhD in Germany or you do a um, co tutel as a kind of a double degree, a PhD, or a the, what we call the sandwich model. So you go for one year or for two years um, to Germany, and but you will get your degree here in Brazil. Um, you will, the, the monthly allowance is between 1,200 uh, 1, and 1,300. This depends on the funding uh, organization. CAPES pays more. <laughs> But um, it's not the, the PhD candidate who chooses the, the funding organization, but the funding organization that says, okay, he's, I'll, I'll take that one, and DID takes the other one. Um, you should be, have good, good grades, of course, and a project, a research project. Also for applying, you already need a contact in Germany. You already need a host. Um, Orientador. That can be sometimes a little bit difficult to get in contact if you do not now, right now, um, a host in Germany. As a, hmm? um, no, it depends. In, I guess in physics it can be in, in English. You need a good level of English normally uh, about B2. And in the, I guess in the last call they wanted B2 in English or in German. So if you do not speak German by now, but your host says, okay, it's okay if, if you communicate in English and you write your uh, doctor, PhD thesis in English, it's fine. But if you, I recommend anyhow to learn German if you live in Germany for a year or more. Um, if you are doing your, your PhD and you're getting funding by CAPES. You can think about um, doing a research stay in Germany from two to six months, and you will get, I don't know, auxilio, I don't know what it is in, <laughs> some odd money. <laughs> yeah. You stay with your, you keep your, you have your scholarship, your CAPES scholarship, and you will get more, 650 euros and a travel allowance. So, but right now, this is only for CAPES, but we are working on it to, do it also for CMPQ students, uh, PhD candidates, uh, PhD students, and I, maybe also for PESTE. But one is there. 
Uh, next deadline, okay, this is in the 28th of February, a little bit sooner, but the next one is the 1st of April, and I guess that could be an idea, if you are, if you are interested in doing research in Germany. Um, there are also research days for experienced um, researchers and university professors. This is from one to three months, and you will also get a travel allowance. And my main solidarity, the scholarship rate, is 2,000 euros or 2,150 euros. Also, you need, of course, also need a host or a host institution in this, this context. And the next deadline is the first of April, but there will be another one probably in December. For the Germans who really like to be here in Brazil, um, we have this short-term lectureship. So if you want to teach in Brazil, could be interesting maybe to apply for a short-term lectureship. And um, it's, I guess, the minimum is one month to up to six months. And you, you have to, to teach at least four lessons per week. So this is a small, the lectureship. Okay. So these were kind of our programs. There are some more, but I promise to be short because Katrin will inform, uh, get, uh, will inform you about the German Research Foundation. And but I have some uh, informational information material right here, and maybe that you can grab it in the during the coffee break. So welcome everybody. I will take some more 10 minutes from your coffee break. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> I will present you now the German Research Foundation for the Brazilians who are not so much um, aware of what a German Research Foundation is. The Germans know much better, certainly. And of our collaboration programs, we are able to provide for collaboration between Brazilian and German researchers. Um, uh, the DAD and the DFG is somewhat, um, are somewhat sister organizations, the DAG, and, and therefore are somewhat complementary. Um, whereas, um, while the, DFG, the DAD is funding very much on individuals, on academics, on students, PhD students, doc, postdocs, and so on, we are start, starting funding um, research projects on the one hand side, and <clears throat> at DFG, only people having a PhD are eligible. So this is the first information for you and um, the most, um, uh, one of the, the, the differences between DVG and DAD. And moreover, um, at DVG, only people are eligible who would like to stay in, re in Germany and do research in Germany. So um, you can, as Brazilian who would like to stay in, in Brazil, you are not eligible to apply for funding to the DFG. This is one other important message. No. <laughs> no, this is, uh, we are providing programs, as you will see later on, to, um, um, to foster or finance research projects together with our Brazilian partners in order to allow you to collaborate or for PhD student postdocs also to do research in Germany, or also senior, senior, senior scientists. Yeah, you have to be in Germany, that's a problem. <laughs> or not. <laughs> okay, so. Um, 
<clears throat> very briefly, one, one very um, other strong characteristic of German Research Foundation that we are a so-called bottom-up funding organization. That means we are funding all kinds of research. We don't follow priorities, we don't define priorities, but we accept research proposals in any area of research, of any, any topic, anything you would like, you are interested in, you may apply to uh, receive funding um, by DFG. Um, uh, we are organized like a club, and as at any club, we have members, and our members are university and research institutions, just to understand our, our policy. We are not directly under the roof of uh, a ministry in Germany, and that gives us also the, the liberty um, DFG correct, is characterized by. And we are also um, interested in international collaboration uh, because nowadays um, research is a global um, issue and therefore DFG also uh, supports international collaboration. Uh, to give you some numbers, in 2007 DFG was funding over 30,000 research projects with an annual budget of 3.2 billion euros. We have about 35 um, different research programs um, from the funding of individual research projects to um, uh, research consortia um, to international collaboration, research infrastructure, and so on. Um, international collaboration we perform via agreements on the one hand side. We are maintaining close um, um, contacts to, to our international funding partners. But we have also some offices abroad, not so many as the DAD, but at least we are on almost every continent. And uh, the youngest office is actually the one in Sao Paulo being responsible for international collaboration with Latin American countries. So not only Brazil, but all Latin American countries up to the Caribbean. And uh, this is our, where we are in this nice building there. <laughs> Uh, and what we do here, we provide information, we um, are present at conferences, um, we advise scientists, but we also maintain contact to our um, funding partners, funding organizations like FAPESP, for instance, like CAPES and CMPK, and we develop together with them um, funding instruments or procedures in order to allow you to uh, do research together. Um, in DFG, as I said, has about 35 research um, uh, funding programs. In all of those funding programs, you may include uh, international um, co collaborations in form of um, applying for a budget for ex international exchange of researchers for, for performing of for performing uh, workshops, um, and um, you may invite a researcher for a longer time even. But there are some um, programs we are using more often, and you see here on this on this slide that if you have uh, uh, very few contact only and you don't, don't know your research or your potential research collaboration partner, no, not yet, you may apply for mobility funding to visit this person or to invite this person come over to Germany. Um, or to uh, to have a workshop together with um, the Brazilian and Germans, or between Brazilian and Germans, and we provide funding within one year of research stays and visits and workshops for a funding periods of up to three months. So, being done either um, at once, three months, or or divided into uh, into into shorter periods. If you then have uh, already a research project idea, you might consider to apply for a, a, indeed a research uh, project, so um, which allows you working together for a period up to three years normally. This is a period we have um, at DFG in our research grants program, um, and we provide here um, budget at DFG. This is only the DFG part at the moment. Um, for our personnel, for instrumentation, consumables, travel budget, guest scientists, budget for publication. And there's something which is called Mercato module, which um, provides you or the Germans to invite a foreigner to come over to Germany or a, a senior scientist or sorry, junior scientist to work in the, in the lab or in the projects for a longer time to receive a salary even and um, to enhance the collaboration by this longer um, research thing. 
And if you have more than just one research partner and you have a, a topic of uh, a wide, broader topic of research involving uh, several scientists on, on both sides, you may consider one of the programs which allow funding for research consortia. And this is, uh, we have uh, a DFG funding programs that are called international research training groups that combine um, research and a training program research units involving various scientists or even bigger collaborative research centers. And you see here that at DFG side, those funding programs are long time funding programs. What is important for, and, uh, for us and for you actually is also that we normally, where we have involved um, um, research structures and funding structures, um, we work within the principle of matching funds by DFG for the site in Germany and by the foreign partner organizations. And this is actually the work I'm doing here in, in Brazil. We have a variety of uh, uh, co co cooperation partners on the federal level, on the state level here in Brazil, one of which is our oldest CAPES. Also, we are collaborating, collaborating with CMPK. A very well-established collaboration is FAPESP. Um, um, and uh, we are also collaborating with FAPIMIC and FAPER. Since different times and in different extent, the, the best or the, the more flex, most flexible um, collaboration is certainly together with FAPESP. So if you are, you are here in the, in the right state, if you are from the state of Sao Paulo, so you have in principle all opportunities to receive funding for research collaboration. Very briefly, we allow funding with, together with FAPESP for the initiation of a collaboration, so you get, can get some, some money for travel and for workshops. As I explained um, before, within a year you may travel there for the period of three months. At DFG, this is called Initiation of International Collaboration, and at FAPES, there are two, three programs, and, and uh, two or three FAPES programs they are using for providing a sp specific money for workshops and travels, like print, province, and sprint. Then for research projects, uh, which provide, food, provide you money for doing extra research and not only for travel. Um, we have, uh, together with FAPESP, um, you, pro you, you may apply for funding for a project for up to three years. Um, you submit in parallel your proposals to both sides, which ha should have the same scientific project kernel. There's no submission deadline, so you can submit your project at any time. At DFG, you may use the research grant programs, and at FAPESP, this is called Auxilio Pesquisa Regular. Um, at the moment, we have separate peer review, but a joint decision between DFG and FAPESP. And we fund also uh, coordinated programs or collaborative research programs between various scientists. Um, um, Again, you would submit the proposal at any, at, at any time on both sides on, on the same time. Um, again, you have the same, same description of scientific project kernel. We have no submission deadlines. We have some st restrictions according to the programs um, um, at DFG. You can, may submit at any time, as I see, said, but the, the, the procedure is somewhat specific. It's a two-stage procedure um, where you have firstly to submit a draft proposal and then you may be invited to submit a full proposal. But uh, together with FAPES, we jointly evaluate those projects because they are long-term projects, they are bigger projects, and we jointly decide um, those projects on-site, so either on at the un applying university in Germany or at the applying university in Brazil. And in Germany, we are using, make use of the program International Research Training Group, which provides funding for up to nine years, research units up to six to eight years, that has changed a bit, um, the collaborative research centers up to 12 years, and at FAPESP, FAPESP is very flexible, they are using just one program, <laughs> and this is called Auxilia Pesquisa Projeto Temático. If you have more questions later on, I will provide you with some details if you, if you would like to. This is an example of a joint international research training group. Um, it's in physics, actually, so you're a right audience here. It's 
dynamic phenomena in complex networks. Um, the objective is a structured training of PhD students under excellent research conditions and an international exchange. So the PhD students may spend at least six months in the other in the laboratory of the collaboration partner on the other side, no, in Germany or Brazil. Um, which should be part of the PhD thesis. So this is no extra um, extra mobility um, stay, but but part of the PhD thesis. That also means that the individual projects within this bigger project or bigger program should be very much uh, connected and 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 networking and collaborating. That um, the PhD students indeed um, is part of an international um, atmosphere. And this is working very well. It's, it's now in the second funding phase. It's um, being funded since 2011 and will be funded between until 2021. And the institutions involved are INPI, uh, the USPI also, um, some other institutions here in Brazil, the University, Humboldt University of Berlin, and the, the financing is, comes from FAPESP and DEVG. Um, the total investment um, um, in these nine years, about eight million euros. It involves up to 15 principal investigators, um, and uh, on each side, about, about 15 or up to 15 financed PhDs. Sometimes you have some other PhD students also contributing, but financed are more or less 15 on each side. Okay, very briefly, um, one other strong collaboration is together with CAPES. Uh, we have been funding mobility, we have been funding research projects, we are on the way to establish such a joint international research training group program, which would be very nice because CAPES is the right organization for co-funding this and then we would have actually the opportunity Brazilian wide, so Brazil wide. Um, what we have with CAPES very uh, during uh, very established during the last ten years, a program which is called Brage Kring, a collaborative initiative in the area of manufacturing and engineering, which has been funded from 2008 to 2018. This is in principle for the Germans um, who know the DFG programs, uh, in principle a bilateral priority program. Um, so a network of uh, a variety of, um, of individual bilateral research projects, so bilateral research projects, um, smaller consortia, that are somehow networked. And um, this involves also student exchange um, this involves annual meetings um, between the researchers involved. On each side, we have a coordinator um, who is managing the, the network somehow. And every second year, we have a call to, um, to, um, to take up uh, new proposals to be funded and to extend funded projects. And since this um, kind of program has worked very well, we have um, had the aim to extend this idea to other areas. So in the, next, in the last year, we have been launched a call in the field of chemistry, industry, and advanced digitalization. Um, also in the last year, so this, has been, this is running at, at, at the moment, we have been launching a call in the area of law. And the next call in, in this area, or a bit extended maybe also to physics, um, will be in 2020. So um, we inform you normally via the websites of CAPES, via the websites of DFG. We have something at DFG which is called Information for Scientists. So if you are um, if you are ordered this information of scientists, you will get any information on that. And this is what I would wanted to pro provide you very briefly. If you have more questions, please don't hesitate to contact. As this is our team here in Sao Paulo, and we provide you any information we may give you. Thank you very much. So, um, we have another, I think we postponed questions and comments to the, to the round table, and we have a talk by the director of the ICTP, Sarah Nathan Berkowitz, who the talk is already up on the computer, I put it before.
Okay, so thanks for all of you for coming here. I guess this is for the people who haven't been here before. Um, so this is a center um, started 2011, connected with ICTP and Trieste. Um, so the people you may have already met are the, the people who do most of the work, Jandir and Umberto, and Lucas is the one who was just helping with the computer equipment. Um, so I'm the director, the vice director is Rogeri Rosenfeld, who many of you may also know. Um, so the motivation is, of course, to create a theoretical physics institute similar to the institutes that exist in other parts of the world. In South America, there are very few such institutes. Um, part of the problem is that South America has very diverse uh, environments. Some countries have highly developed research. Some countries don't. Um, and South America has some problems with bureaucracy that makes um, it a problem to have a center like this without, um, at least, without the bureaucracy involved of the of organizing workshops. I think everybody from Brazil who's organized a workshop knows that um, it's not a pleasant activity. Um, so there are some successful institutes in South America. IMP is in mathematics, I think, is, is the best known. And the idea of ICTP and Trieste was to create regional centers similar to ICTP but in the different regions. So we were the first one. We were created for South America. That's our name, um, South American Institute for Fundamental Research. There was one created in Chiapas in Mexico for Central America. There's one in China that's being created now, and one in Rwanda for African continent. So um, why this institute in Sao Paulo for South America? So this is the oldest graduate, uh, at least, um, one of the oldest graduate schools in theoretical physics. It started more than 60 years ago, in 1952. Um, it has a small department, just 20, approximately 20 professors, but it doesn't have undergraduates. So the professors are more or less free to do research and to organize activities. Um, of course, we're located in some, the state of Sao Paulo, which has the benefit of FAPES, which was already mentioned, is probably the most stable funding agency in South America. And of course, Sao Paulo is the biggest city um, in South America. It has many uh, large universities. So although we have just a small graduate physics department, um, the biggest university in South America, USP, is 45 minutes away. Um, and there's also Campinas, which is a few hours away. And there's a new university where I think people were a few days ago in, in a suburb of Sao Paulo, uh, Santo Andre. OK. so. Um, this is a short history of, of more or less our institute in picture. So this is the old IFT Institute. Um, this is FAPES. Um, this is Trieste. So it started actually our institute before the others. Then the UNESP started. So we joined the university soon after the university was founded in 1987. Um, we were originally in a different place near your hotel for the foreigners that are staying um, near Pamplona. Uh, we get some funding from private foundations, such as the Simons Foundation and also Perimeter, which was started as a private theoretical physics institute, but now has support from the government of Canada. So this is in Waterloo. We moved here in 2009, about 10 years ago. And this new center inside the IFT was started in 2010, 2011. So it's relatively recent. It's um, seven, eight years old almost. Uh, we're funded mostly by FAPESP to FAPES grants, similar to the, the thematic grants that were mentioned in the last talk. Um, we have tenure track professors that are funded by Simons Foundation. We also have, uh, of course, tenured professors that are funded by the university. And last year, or a year and a half ago, there was started a new private foundation in Brazil, Cepillera Institute, which also funds some of our outreach activities. So they're trying to be something like the Simons Foundation in Brazil. So uh, we've had some impact. So for example, the university that we are part of was named by nature as the um, most improved institute. So they do this every few years. And this was of all the institutes in South America, in Latin America, actually. Uh, this is our council. We have uh, the director of, um, of ICTP as the head of our council. We also have uh, the head of FAPES, scientific director of FAPES, is on our council. We have the president of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, and now it's Luis Davidovich. Uh, we have people from other institutions. This is the Peter Goddard, the ex-director of 
um, Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. So this is a council which um, essentially is independent of the bureaucracy of the university and it involves 10 scientific um, members which have a rotating five, four to eight term mem membership and they're representative either of different countries or different areas in South America. So funding, as I already mentioned, uh, the university funds our staff members, so the secretaries, and also they fund up to five permanent professors. And of course, they also fund all the infrastructure of the IFT, so all the professors and all the secretaries of the building where we are. Um, and FAPES funds our activities. So uh, in addition, they fund postdoc positions, also these young investigator positions. Um, and they also give us funding, for example, for uh, scientific journalism, et cetera. ICTP essentially funds visitors coming from other countries in South America, and they also help to organize schools together with them and workshops together with them in Trieste. So we have many joint activities. As I mentioned, we also have funding from some private sources, Perimeter Institute, they fund a joint faculty position, and we also have a joint school with them and a joint master's program. So um, this is something that started three or four years ago and is very successful. Um, we have Simons, some money from Simons Foundation, which funds two tenure track positions. We have money from the Ser Pieta Private Institute in Brazil that funds our outreach program. And we also have some private donations. And of course, we also get funding from the federal agency of CMPQ and COPS. And we have many research exchange agreements, including, for example, with Mainz in Germany. So they are planning to have some joint activity with them starting next year also. So that might be interesting. It might be interesting to involve the various funding agencies in Germany for that. The research, so of course we're part of the IFT physics department, but uh, the researchers in, in the center are um, chosen through a scientific uh, search committee. So we have an international search committee that chooses these members. Um, so they're in different areas. Uh, the most recent member, Alini Hamidis, she joined us last year. And actually this year she's now in Germany in, in Dresden with a, at the Max Planck Institute. So she's going to spend a year there and then come back here and hopefully she'll bring collaborators with her that can also take part in these exchange agreements with Germany. Um, so we also have postdocs, as I mentioned, funded by FAPES. We have many visiting researchers that take part in our activities and come for programs. Um, we also have a search, which actually, this was an old transparency. We have a new Simons FAPES fellow that will start next year acting in the, inter, in the interdisciplinary area of biological physics. Um, so we have associate members from all over South America. Um, so these are, of course, the people from Sao Paulo, but we also have from the different countries in South America and from other regions in Brazil. They help us with organizing activities and they're frequent visitors here. Um, okay, so activities. So this is one of our activities. We also have um, activities for PhD students and master's students, these international schools. So they're generally two-week schools and we have 50 or 60 students that come to study some focused activity and some advanced topic which is not covered in the usual courses. Um, I think that's a highly successful activity. We have, um, well, all of the infrastructure necessary for this. We also have mini courses, programs and workshops, typical like this one. And we have outreach activities um, for all different kinds of public, but in the last year we're focused on high school students. We have courses here for high school students on Saturdays. Um, it's advanced topics that aren't given in, in, in high school classes, but um, you just need to know high school mathematics in order to, to get into some of these modern physics topics. We also, of course, have informal lectures. Um, I'll show you some slides. So this is a, a series of lectures we have in a museum that mixes a physicist and an artist. We also have informal lectures in a pub. Um, by physicists, but um, mostly it's just question and answer period. Um, so it's a, it's a nice way to involve the public in our activities. And as I mentioned, we have these activities for high school students. So these are the courses that are given by physics professors for high school students. And this is a, a school we have once a year for attracting the best undergraduates to our um, department. So the idea is that at the end of this school, we have a, an exam, and the best scorers on the exam get invited to a joint program with this institute in Perimeter in Canada. And they spend a year here and a year in Canada. So um, these are the activities in 2019. So 
So we have all kinds of schools and workshops. Um, this is, of course, one of them, I guess, should be here, this one here. Um, and there are other ones that will go on in 2020. So these activities are chosen once a year by our scientific council. So the most recent um, council meeting was in February. So they've chosen the activities for 2020. Um, if you want to propose activities or you want to visit or you want to um, take part in our activities, all the information is on our web page. So this is the web page address. And if there are any questions, I'm, I'm here the whole week. So feel free to knock on my door and ask me any questions. OK, so thank you.